نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا على سيدنا ونان محمد بارك وسلم عليه سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله Continuing with the subject of Imam Hussain al-Islam in Karbala, uh, as we were talking last week, you know, on the 9th of Muharram, on that morning when Imam Hussain al-Islam, he goes and he addresses the forces of Yazid. And we talked about what he mentioned, you know, that, you know, if there is a ruler who makes what, is, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal, haram, and what he has made hal uh, haram halal and he violates the way of Rasulullah and institutes his own way and he oppresses the people and all of these things that if there is a Muslim who is observing this and he does not say anything or do anything depending on his capability you know whether he can say or do depending on the capability and he doesn't do anything, then on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will throw that Muslim in fire along with that ruler. And then he told them directly that, look, you know, be aware that Yazid and his administration are doing exactly these things. You know, they have left the way of Rahman, the way of Allah, and, and adopted the way of Shaitan. So he says this, but of course, everything he says falls on deaf ears. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about those who are devoid of faith, he says, deaf, dumb, and blind. You know, when the heart is sealed, then nothing good can enter it. When... This is why, you know, when, when he starts talking like this, you know, one aspect of it is that that afternoon, the, the drum beats, the war beat, war drum started beating. And we'll get into why they did this right then. But if we look at the world today, as we, talk, we were talking about last week, all of the rulers in the world fall into this category. whether they're in the Muslim world or the non-Muslim world. It doesn't matter. You know, whether they claim to be Muslim or they don't claim to be Muslim. You know, they have, all of them have a certain agenda. They fight amongst each other because they're vying for their position. But when it comes to Islam, just as Rasulullah told us, they're all one. You know, it's like the Democrats and the Republicans here. There's no difference. The talking points are different simply because they distract you from a different direction. But the end result of what they do is the same. And so when we look throughout the world, this is the way it is. The difference is, then we had Imam Hussein al-Islam to hold up this banner, to give his blood, to give life to the tree of Islam. And we'll talk about this, so after him so many different revolutions spurred it up, came up. Today we all sit silent. And those who, who
who try to say or do something are silenced. While the rest of us watch from the sidelines. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to cause any turmoil. Because if we're afraid of what will happen to our family or to us. Yet Imam Hussein al-Islam, when he leaves, knowing full well what's going to happen, he leaves with his family, which included the six-month-old child. He is teaching us the sacrifice and the patience that is demanded from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, and the, and the more interesting aspect of this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already promised us that if you that if we do what we're supposed to do then he's going to give us something better and if i try to compare that there's no comparison you know this life is finite it's limited yet the hereafter is unlimited no end so it doesn't matter how comfortable i am here for however long I'm comfortable here, compared to the comfort of the hereafter, I mean, there is no comparison. You can't, you can't compare zero to infinity. And that's what we try to do. And it doesn't matter how bad things get here. Again, it's going to end. So again, it doesn't matter how bad things get here, again, that all ends. But if we end up on the wrong side in the hereafter, then that doesn't end. You know, one of the ways, modern ways of silencing people, which actually is a modern way, they did the same thing in the past. You know, the same thing with Musa al-Islam, if you look at the, uh, the, the when Musa al-Islam is talking to Fir'aun, you know, if they don't like what you say, oh, he's crazy. You know, you get labeled as, as someone who's, who's gone mad, so nobody comes and, and listens to you. So after Imam Hussein al-Islam, he completes this, you know, this sermon basically to the forces of Yazid. And he leaves, and then that afternoon, the drum beats sound off. The war drums start to sound off. The reason this instigated this is what happens is, like in the case of Ibrahim a.s. You know, when Ibrahim a.s., you know, everybody goes for the party, and he doesn't go, and they come back and they see all of these idols that are destroyed, you know, except for one big one. Because Ibrahim a.s., he destroyed them all, and he put the, the axe in the arms of the big, big idol, and he left. And they come back and they say, who could have done this? You know, the Spantar talks about this in the Quran. He says, who could have done this? And they say, oh, that boy. You know, he's the only one who talks against our gods, our idols. So it must have been him. So they go and they grab him and they bring him there. And they say, oh, did you do this? And he says, why are you asking me? You know, ask the big one. <laughs> and they all respond. They say... He can't tell us. And what are you telling us? You know, ask him. He can't tell us. So he says, then why do you worship something that can neither benefit you nor harm you? And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa says, and they started to think. You know, you've got this mob. And Ibrahim al-Islam's 
you know, uh, style of preaching was sarcasm. You know, it forced some thought. So they started, he said, Ellis Mountain says, and they started to think, and then one of them, not the whole group, just one of them yelled out, let's kill him. And just like that, everyone who had started to think, that thought process shuts down, and everybody, that mob, oh, let's kill him. And this is when they tied him up and they threw him into the fire, which we know, of course, Ellis Mountain changed into the garden. But the same thing here. You know, the generals and the leaders of the forces of Yazid, when the, after hearing Imam Hussein al-Islam's talk, now they're afraid that maybe some of our men will start to think. And if they start to think, then we lose our control. You know, again, this is how governments work. They don't want you thinking. You know, that's why now with the news media, which is the visual media, which is such a strong uh, influencer, there's no thought process anymore. There's whatever they spoon feed you. You know, at least when you would read something, you'd have the ability or, or the time to think through things. Whether you use that time or not is a different issue, but you at least have that. But the news now and the media now is so fast. You know, they shift topics and they shift aspects of things and they spoon feed everything that this is how you're supposed to think. So the thought process is all gone. This is also why Allah even 14, you know, from 1400 years ago, today and, and forever, He keeps telling us, why do you not ponder? Why do you not think? Again and again in the Quran, the only book that challenges you, the only religious scripture that challenges you to think. Analyze what's going on. Don't take everything on face value. In fact, don't take anything on face value. And even, you know, those who think they're free thinkers these days, they're not free thinkers anymore. All they, you know, if you listen to them and you analyze what they're saying, all they're doing is they're just feeding you the party line. So when the war drums start to beat, you know, Imam Hussein al-Islam, he asked a few of his men to go and ask them, tell them, look, you know, it's late. You know, it was this, the... This was, that day was Thursday, the 9th of Muharram. The 10th of Muharram has been regarded as auspicious or a special day, and, and that night, which Islamically is the night before the day, you know, has been auspicious since time immemorial. You know, so many things happened. This has been a day that's been set aside for worship from, you know, the beginning. So he says to them, he says, look, this it's late, you know, so give us one more night to at least worship Allah, and especially this night, and then tomorrow you have the whole day to do whatever you want. You know, he says, and where are we going to go? This was the only request that he made that they accepted. So they say, okay, fine. We'll wait till tomorrow. So that night, you know, in the camp of Imam Hussein al-Islam, after they make Aisha Salat, so after the Salat, you know, he addresses those that are with, all of those that are with him, and he says that, you know, everyone here should know that I am very pleased with them. And he says that, you know, he says, look, 
You know, these people, they are after my blood. They are thirsty for my blood. So why don't you, in the darkness of the night, sneak out and get away? You know, which is also interesting, because after they had, after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, Islam, when we talk about that, when he's martyred in the field of Karbala, after that, they don't kill anybody else. Even though Imam Zain al-Abideen is still there. You know, so this is why Imam Hussein, Islam, is telling them, he says, they're only thirsty for my blood. So those who wish to leave and get out, sneak out, you know, I give them full permission and authority and I do this happily. You know, and I'm very pleased with all of you. And they all, they say to him, they say, you know, we will not leave you. Because tomorrow on the day of judgment, if your grandfather asks us, that what did you do when my grandson, at the hour of need for my grandson? At this crucial time, what did you do? Then what face will we show him? <coughs> so none of them left or even thought about leaving. And then, you know, afterwards, then he says to them, he says, look, you know, this is probably our last night. So go back to your tents and make good use of this night. Worship Allah and make tawbah and repentance to him. And, you know, and then spend some of the night to get some rest as well. So they go and everybody is in their own tents and they're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing what's coming the next day. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam, you know, he makes some salat and he does all these things and he's reciting the Quran and as he's reciting the Quran, he dozes off. And when he dozes off, and, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, if we look at also what happened in Badr. You know, if you look in Badr, you have 313 again, 313 ill-equipped. And you know, they didn't come out for war. The 313, you know, amongst them had seven and a half swords. Eight swords, one of them was broken. Literally, I mean, if you look at it from a military standpoint, I mean, they basically have nothing. Compared to an army that's a thousand men who are literally armed to the teeth. There was a soldier amongst them who had a, a, a sword in one hand and a spear in the other, and he had a dagger, he didn't know where to put it, so he put it between his teeth. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sends His peace upon the believers and they go to sleep. <coughs> you know, if you know you're going to be in a battle the next day and, you, and, and you're sure you're going to die, or even if you don't know that, you just think you're going to die, you can't sleep. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends His peace upon them and they all slept. And they woke up well rested. Which shows you the serenity in their hearts. Which is also part of the proof where Allah subhanahu wa says, La khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun when he talks about his friends. That there is no fear and there is no grief upon them. You know, Imam Hussein al Islam, let's say if I even look at it from a worldly perspective, even though he already knows what's going to happen, but from a worldly perspective in that situation, he knows they're thirsty for his blood. 
So irregardless of whether anybody else is, uh, survives this or not, he knows they're going to execute him. And yet the calmness upon him is so great that as he's reading the Qur'an, he dozes off. And when he dozes off, he sees Rasulullah. Rasulullah so, he, doesn't, he doesn't just see Rasulullah so, Rasulullah so, comes to him. And of course, you know, people ask, how do you know this? Because he told the family the next day. That's how we know these things. You know, I heard somebody saying, well, how do you know these things? No one survived Karbala. Well, it's not true. Imam Zain al Abidin and the women were survivors. And some of the narrations are actually from the other side too. We had soldiers from the other side saying, oh, we did this. You know, and their arrogance. Mm -hmm. So when Rasulullah comes to him, and he comes to him and he hugs him, and he kisses him, and he says to him, he says that be steadfast and patient. Mm -hmm. And then he prays to Allah, that Allah make him steadfast and patient in this trial, this, this test of his. Again, you know, we mentioned this early on, the help of Allah. What is the help of Allah? Ya ayu ladina amanu, in tansurullah yansurukum. O you who believe, help Allah and Allah will help you. But how will he help you? Will you thabbit akadamakum? By making your feet firm, making you steadfast, making you patient. And when he talks about the test, that we will test you with what? ولا نبلو أنكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات. That we will surely test you with something of fear, of hunger, of your lives, of your wealth, and your offspring. And then what does he say? وبشر الصابرين. You know, and give glad tidings to those who are patient. So the next morning, you know, when they get up, they make Fajr Salat. And they make Fajr Salat in Jamaat. And shortly after Fajr Salat, there were a couple of generals from the other side that were going close to the tent of Imam Hussein al -Islam. They were passing by. And some of the friends of Imam Hussein al -Islam, they asked permission, said, yeah, you know, oh, our master, give us permission that we will shoot them down right now. You know, and they were close enough, they could have shot, shot them easily with their arrows. So we'll shoot them down right now. And Imam Hussein al-Islam, he says that, no. Because I do not want it to be said that I am the one who started this. Eventually, as the morning carries on, and they see that Imam Hussein al Islam is not going to instigate anything. Then Amr bin Saad comes forward and he shoots a tent, uh, an arrow into the tent of Imam <coughs> Hussein al Islam. And then he makes a declaration that let it be known that I am the first to shoot an arrow in this battle. <coughs> Which is ironic because his father, Saad bin Abi Waqas, radiallahu one of his virtues is that he was the first to shoot an arrow at the enemy of Rasulullah. Hmm. You know, the old adage is that the, tree, that the apple doesn't fall far, far from the tree. Well, that might be true, but sometimes it rolls far away. As Amr did. You know, the other interesting thing here is that if... 
if you had taken any of these leaders of the forces or the army of Yazid, you know, and you tried to analyze them from a worldly perspective, you would have said that, oh, Amr would be the one who would, who would yield in front of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And yet he's the one who shot the arrow first. When we look at Badr, Before the fighting started, Rasulullah Sussam said to his companions, he said that he, there was a man who was riding a red camel. And he says, all the good in them is on this man who is riding the red camel. And if they listen to him, they will all be saved. And that man was Utbah bin Rabi. And so he's the one who tried to convince Quraysh that, oh, I will play, pay the blood money for Amar bin Hadrami, so let's all go back. We don't need to fight. And then Abu Jahal comes and, and strokes his ego. Oh, you're saying this because you're afraid that your son is on the other side and something might happen to him. So he goes from this, from this side of saying, oh, let's not fight, let's go back, to being the first one to come out and challenge the Muslims. So Amr goes from being the most sensible one amongst them to the one who instigates the battle and starts the battle. So we'll continue from here next week, inshallah. You know, but after this, now the fight, now the battle begins. You know, that arrow, that first arrow has been thrown. So the fighting will now now begin and we'll talk about this inshallah starting next week so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his family his companions and all of those whom they love inshallah those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah inshallah